the meeting with Putin, I was very straightforward. There were no minced words. It was polite, but I made it very clear. If, in fact, he invades Ukraine, there will be severe consequences. Severe consequences. Economic consequences like none he's ever seen or ever have been seen. If, in fact, we would probably also be required to reinforce our, our presence in NATO countries to reassure particularly those in the Eastern Front. In addition to that, I made it clear that we would provide the defensive capability to the uh, Ukrainians as well. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Backstory. I'm Dana Lewis. On this Backstory Ukraine, did U.S. President Biden head off an invasion from Russia? Did Putin blink? Well, we don't know yet. But serious sanctions were threatened against Russia, economic sanctions, the kind Russia has never experienced, said Biden. And Putin has to think again. So we will only talk sanctions on this backstory with an expert on what makes countries like Russia and Iran sit up and take notice before they act against American and European interests. He's an expert because he designed some of them in a previous role at the U.S. Department of Treasury. All right, I want to introduce you to Brian O'Toole, who worked at the U.S. Department of Treasury from 2009 to 2017. Uh, he was a senior advisor to the director of the Office of Foreign Assets Control, which means he helped manage the implementation of all financial sanctions programs, and he played a central role in designing the U.S. sanctions regime in response to Russia uh, in Ukraine from 2014, and he also negotiated the multilateral sanctions imposed by the EU, the European Union, and G7 in coordination with the United States and Brian is also with the Atlantic Council. Hi, Brian. Hi there. Hey, I'm very excited to talk to you because I have spent a career reporting on sanctions uh, at different times when I was based in Russia uh, at different moments, depending on what they were doing, whether it was Georgia, whether it was the use of a chemical nerve agent here in the UK, and then now from 2014 forward with Ukraine. And there is so much debate about sanctions. And a lot of people say sanctions don't work. And I think that you'll tell me that they do. And I want to hear you tell, you know, what is your assessment of the, those years of sanctions against Russia? Have they really accomplished anything? I, I always struggle with people who say they don't work, right? You know, nobody ever says diplomacy doesn't work um, just because we're not getting what we want from, from another country. Um, and sanctions essentially are a tool of diplomacy, right? It's a, it's a tool of, you know, statecraft in the United States. Um, and they don't work without everything else around there. Um, the, the challenge that I think a lot of people have with Russia in particular is, is they take a very simplistic view. Russia is still in the Donbass and Crimea, therefore sanctions don't work. Sanctions were never meant to dislodge Putin and the Kremlin from the eastern part of Ukraine um, or Crimea. They were meant to provide leverage for negotiations. Um, sanctions essentially were meant to forge the Minsk Accords, right? And so you can take issue with, with where Minsk is today. It, it certainly doesn't seem like it's, it's a viable kind of solution given where Putin sees it and, and with all the kind of political challenges Ukraine has with Russian noncompliance and and, you know, the, the promulgation of this kind of static war, cold war, whatever you want to call it, yeah, um, yeah. for the, the last eight years. But that's that's the challenge, right, is it's sanctions were, you know, on Russia are actually quite small, even though they're imposed against very large companies and, and the government. Um, and so, you know, you can't expect that they're going to do the work of the entirety of, of what a di diplomatic approach ought to be. Um, All right. But now that seems like it changed with this meeting with President Biden and President Putin, because rather than talk about putting American troops on the ground in Ukraine, for instance, yeah. uh, these sanctions are supposedly the nuclear sanctions, and they are meant to dissuade Putin from further invading Ukraine. What is in the nuclear warhead? And I don't actually, I don't even like to, to, to have parallels with nuclear anything between two nuclear powers. But all right, let's go with the characterization from the State Department. What is in that warhead that would dissuade Putin? 
Yeah. So, I mean, big banking sanctions, I think, are the, the next thing on the table. Um, it, it's hard to imagine the U.S. going after energy at the moment, but I think you know, U.S. financial power is unparalleled, right? The, the number of payments, cross-border payments that come through the United States um, is astronomical. It goes well beyond your standard measures of, you know, contracts denominated in dollars or payments denominated in dollars, right? A lot of times what happens is even a payment that's not denominated in dollars that has an origination and termination in countries entirely foreign to the U.S., that'll come through New York City, because the banks involved in the transaction need to swap currencies. And the way everybody does that in the banking industry is they go through dollars, right? Everybody's long in the dollar. So when they settle up a transaction, right? If you're Russia and you're transacting with um, with Turkey, for instance, right? There are Russian tourists who go to Turkey. So there is some demand for the Turkish lira in Russia, but it's not like there's much. And so if you have a large contract to export gas to Turkey, for instance, those payments will go through the dollar, even if you don't denominate any part of the transaction. In dollars. These are the because, swift, swift payments. Yeah, essentially. Yeah. So what, what happens is there, there will be a transaction in foreign exchange where somebody will purchase, you know, say if you're in Russia, you need to purchase, um, purchase Turkish lira. You do that by going essentially through the United States because you're going to exchange dollars in the back end to help balance out your currency risk as a bank. So all these payments flow through the United States um, means U.S. sanctions, particularly in the financial markets, are extraordinarily powerful. And so if the U.S. were to decide to go after, say, Vinesh Ekonom Bank, um, Gazprom Bank and the Russian you know, Direct Investment Fund, RDIF, one of the sovereign wealth funds, there's a reasonable chance that Gazprom Bank wouldn't be able to make international payments. It might kill Vinesh Ekonom Bank altogether, which is kind of not the most solvent institution in the world, as I understand it. Um, and it effectively puts the RDIF out of business. Um, those are big economic effects looking at, at Putin. And so I don't know exactly what's in kind of, you know, the... But one sec, though. Is that a sectoral yeah. sanction against banking or is that suspension of SWIFT payments? No, no, that's that's so the SWIFT thing is a separate matter. It's kind of a red herring. We can talk about that, too. But it's it's imposing what the U.S. calls blocking or asset freezes on those. So what that is, is a cess- it's a, a freezing of assets and a cessation of all dealings, including clearing payments right. on behalf of them. Right. So what applies to, um, you know, uh, you know, the IRGC, right, um, without the terrorism, label, that. That's essentially the same sanction that I that I believe they're discussing or understand that that is in discussion for some financial institutions in Russia. Tricky um, business, right? Because Gazprom moves gas, which yep. Europe buys and uses. So how can you go about sanctioning the person who heats your home? Well, I, I said Gazprom Bank, right? So it's the bank that finances a lot of it and has other other obligations. And again, I, I don't know whether that one's on the table. Um, or not, but Gazprom Bank is subject to sectoral sanctions, right? So it has certain restrictions on its ability to, to raise capital in Western markets as part of the sanctions in 2014. So you would certainly think that the banks that are already kind of sanctioned by the United States and Europe would also be in the, the mix for increased sanctions pressure. And that's that's where this goes next, in, in my view, is, is to those institutions that are there and could um, could be the targets for increased pressure, harsher sanctions. These are huge, massive re- revenue earners for the state, are they not? Absolutely, yeah. And that's you know that's part of the thinking, right? Is if you go after Vinesh Ekonom Bank, for instance, um, you know, essentially like the slush, slush fund for Putin to, to invest in, in the country. It's what financed the Sochi Olympics um, and all the the wasteful spending there that you know propped up the patronage and corruption networks. You know, Vinesh Ekonom Bank doesn't have ordinary depositors. It's not a bank in the traditional sense. So you're not you're not necessarily hurting the ordinary Russian who's carrying a debit card around and trying to swipe it at a grocery store um, in, in Moscow. You are getting to the people who are closer to the Kremlin and reliant on the Kremlin's patronage to maintain power, wealth, whatever. Right. So why um, wasn't this done long ago? I mean, these are Putin's wallets. <laughs> this is what people like to use that term. Why didn't we do it in 2014? Well, in 2014, right, there were there were sanctions imposed that were meant to go after certain aspects of Russian financing. Um, and the sanctions were meant to f- provide leverage for a diplomatic deal. We got a diplomatic deal in 2014. It was the Minsk II Accords. By all accounts, you know, and most outside observers, 
thought that they were reasonable steps to de-escalate the conflict in the Donbass. And then essentially the, the theory was you deal with Crimea after the Donbass is settled, right? So there's there's some separate settlement on Crimea that's that's kind of got to happen regardless of what happens in, in the Donbass. And so in 2014, there was not necessarily a need to impose harsher sanctions, even if they were to go, even if they were mostly targeted at kind of the elite in Russia or the, the wallets, um, because Minsk was was agreed. And so, you know, you can quibble with kind of policy since then about when, when or, you know, <laughs> when Minsk too became kind of functionally dead or, or zombie, but, um, you know, and whether sanctions should be considered then. But I think, you know, there was a reasonable expectation that Minsk too was a, a good path forward for, for the sides what, involved. In the yeah, I mean, the Ukrainians would argue they got the short end of the stick and and the two sides. Anyway, I don't want to get into Minsk, but the two sides, obviously, are very different versions of what the Minsk Accords would be if they were implemented, whether they would get a veto in the Donbass against, you know, uh, Ukraine ever joining NATO or joining the EU or whatever. But so what's the danger of using the big hammer, like some of these sanctions going after those big, big banks? What, what is the danger? Gazprom Bank is is your danger, right? So Gazprom Bank finances a lot of the the um, the energy exports from Russia um, and finances projects. So there's there's that piece of it, um, right? You could interrupt energy markets at a time when Europe has low storage. The price of of gas, natural gas around the world is is astronomically high, um, and everybody in particular Europe is looking at a really cold winter. That's that's a tough thing to to think about. You know, the other thing, too, is is these banks all have tentacles that people don't ever realize. Gazprom Bank is the custodian for D- American depository receipts of Russian companies. And, and for the, if you're not familiar with financial markets, what that is, is every Russian company essentially that trades its stock in the U.S. market, whether that's the NASDAQ, um, whether that's and there, the SEC. And there are many. Yeah. Gazprom Bank essentially is the intermediary for all of that in Russia. So if you sanction Gazprom Bank without thinking about the consequences, you could essentially freeze every Russian company's stock that trades in the United States. And you have a big impact on, say, pension funds in the United States, right? Those, those are things you have to understand and figure out how to mitigate if you're going to contemplate sanctions. It's, it's no different than trying to figure out how you're going to mitigate the effect of sanctioning, you know, Oleg Deripaska and what happens to Rousseau. So there's a whole cascade when you look at sanctions. Like I think yeah. I, I read that one of, one of the sanctions ideas would be you could go after big insurance companies, but insurance companies insure big ships at sea, including Russian mm-hmm. ships that are moving goods all over the world. Yeah, absolutely. And those those things are scary, right? This is the case in Iran, right? There's, there's a, a huge set of sanctions that target the shipping industry and the oil industry in Iran. And there's a lot of focus from the international insurance companies on Iranian ships floating around the world. The, the thing nobody really talks that much about, right? So what, what the Iranians will say is, look, we've insured it domestically, right? So this ship floating around the world with, you know, 130 million liters of, of oil is insured domestically. Iran can't cover that if there's an accident, right? Like that, that cost is well beyond the ability of any insurers in Iran to pay, let alone the government. And so these ships are essentially floating around with, you know, insurance that's not worth all that much. If, you know, you, if it capsizes off the coast or something like that and spills hundreds of millions of liters of oil, that that's a risk you run. Um, but by the by the same token, if Iran knows they're running that risk, there are fewer things they're going to be willing to put out there because if they have to pay for them and it's going to bankrupt them, that's an economic decision. And so that's that's where you consider kind of the pluses and minuses of. If you go after, say, SoGaz, which is an insurance company in Russia that was owned by the Rotenberg brothers and briefly subject to sanctions in 2014. And they're um, close to Putin. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and you know, close to Bank Russia and all the other, like, you know, stuff that, that goes on there. If you sanction SoGaz, there may be some effects. And those may be, some of those may be good effects that you want. You want to you have an impact. Some of those may be things you want to mitigate. You've got to figure out or at least try to, try to pick and choose as much as you can. It's, it's harder with Russia than Iran. It's harder I, with Russia than, than most other countries. I'm sure that President Biden didn't, you know, lean through the video call to Putin and start talking company names and bank names, did he? But what do you think he would have said to, to make it very clear that this was a hammer blow of sanctions threatened? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's exactly right. And you don't you don't want to tip your hand 
um, for a variety of reasons. And you, you, you don't want to, you know, if you're sitting there in, in Biden's chair, like yeah. drawing red lines is really freaking dangerous with Putin because he'll just go slightly in a different direction. And then you're left with, well, I've threatened this huge, massive action and he hasn't done exactly what I set the red line at, you know, it's, and Biden will know this well, right? This was one of the Obama administration's biggest challenges. In- but he would have said to him, what we will, we will bring your banking to it. Yeah, we, we are going to, we are going to destroy at least some of, if not all of your state owned banks. Um, we are coming for your economy. If you do this um, and not just, you know, the things that they've done now, which are, constraining but not death sentences, right? U.S. sanctions on a bank are a death sentence. Um, bank Russia, the, the you know famous crony bank in Russia that we hit in 2014, overnight went from being a, a fairly large international Russian bank, you know, it was, it was you know, top 20 maybe or something like that. I forget exactly how big it was, but it had, you know, lots of international connections. Overnight, it was a ruble only bank. Um, and it only survived because of, Russian government patronage. which they switched, you know, things like um, utilities payments to, to have to f- flow through Bank Russia for, for people in Russia, things like that. U.S. sanctions on banks essentially are a death knell. They don't exist functionally, especially international. Without- Before we move from the, the sectoral discussion, and I know we could we could go through a lot of stuff, but do you think that yeah. some of the sectoral sanctions should expand into beyond oil and gas into, you know, mining, coal, other things? I mean, I think I think there are calculations that they have to make about all of this, right? There are supply chain issues at the moment that may be exacerbated by going after Russian minerals. Um, you know, it, it doesn't mean that they're unsolvable or they're bad ideas, but they have to understand the impact. Like steel, for instance, if you you go after steel, we yeah. they export a lot of steel. Yeah, you and and right, the whole point of sanctions is to hurt the other guy, not yourself, right? Right. Um, and so you you have to make sure that you're not you're not cutting off your nose to spite your face. Um, and that's that's a tough calculation, and and that may augur against you know some of the you know say Evraz or the other big kind of you know Rusal, the other big minerals companies. Um, it may mean that something like Al Rosa is not a bad target, though, because the diamond market isn't, you know, necessarily as central to the global economy. Um, so some of those things you might see start to create, you know, I would expect if Russia rolls across the border, there's a package of sanctions that's centered around banks, a handful of other companies, some cronies, and then a whole bunch of like people who are are precipitating the conflict in, in eastern Ukraine. Right? Cronies, you mean like inner circle? Yeah, like but, Al Sharif. So, but we've like, talked about that a lot, right? I mean, the, the again and again, we've heard that sanctions target his inner circle. I mean, how big is the circle? And haven't they already been sanctioned a lot of them? Well, I, I think I think of it as like concentric circles, right? So the the true inner circle, like the the guys who have all their dashas in the same place outside of St. Petersburg, like those guys, the, the Rodenbergs, Timchenko, they've all been sanctioned. Go we'll check. Um Deripaska you know, is kind of that next circle out from like the true inner circle. Um, and then there's a whole category of people, I think, that fit in there. Um, you know, Usmanov and, and others probably fit somewhere in that circle or the next one out. And I think that's that's where it goes is you, you see the, the focus on the inner one and then kind of radiating out as as more and more cronies get sanctioned. That's that's well, at least I think the escalation. Matter. A lot of people won't know those names, but there are many other names that are, you know, Russian oligarchs, and the media loves to use the term. Let's, you know, we're going to go after the oligarchs. Yeah, but uh, is some of that unfair because some of those wealthy Russians who made their money after the collapse of the Soviet Union, in fact, a lot of them have put their kids into British schools and tried to move abroad and tried to move away from the, yeah. the Kremlin and had their had their companies seized by the Kremlin and Putin's inner circle and. I mean, not because you're an oligarch doesn't mean you're pro-Putin and and you should be automatically be a target of sanctions, right? I, I think that's right, and I think I think that's where the the administration's head is too. It's it's this kind of delicate determination of if they're operating in country, are they just kissing the ring, or are they more actively involved? And you know, I think with with somebody like Deripaska, with some of the allegations swirling around the 2016 election. Um, and other things, it was the calculation was probably made. Look, it, this goes beyond just like 
you exist in Russia as a businessman and therefore you have to pay homage to this guy who styles himself as, as the, you know, the czar, um, you know, and, and, and where you draw that line may be different depending on kind of who's making decisions. But I think, I think it's absolutely fair characterization to say that, that not all Russian oligarchs deserve to be sanctioned because not all Russian oligarchs are, you know, kind of pro Putin flag wavers. This has been many times described as a kleptocracy. Yes. When you when the U.S. <laughs> Treasury puts sanctions on some of the inner circle, um, the ever expanding circle, um, do you think that the, the, they can bring a lot of pressure to bear on Putin himself because the people around him at a certain point say, wait a minute, that's our money in those banks. That's the, that's our wealth. And at a certain point, it destabilizes the regime. The theory is that you can you can exert pressure on Putin by going after the people around him, right, and, and going after their money. Um, that you, you whether think? that destabilizes the regime or not, I, I'm a little skeptical of regime destabilization as as a desirable goal, just in general, right? I, I worry about power vacuums in Russia and, and whoever's coming next, because <clears throat> you know, even administering like the the state of Russia is. No, no, Putin has killed all opposition, both literally and figuratively. So it's not it's not as if there are people ready to step in. But yeah, I mean, the idea is when you go after Deripaska, you know, regardless of what people think about the deal with Rousseau, like Deripaska's net worth has been reduced by many billions of dollars. And that has to have some impression or at least mental pressure on Deripaska for how he deals with Putin, right? And if you get more people in that boat, maybe you get at least some push for moderation of policy. Um, you know, Putin relies on that patronage network and corruption to stay in power. And so if you undermine the spoils of that, you you undermine the power structure that he sits on top of. Um, and he has to he has to weigh very simply uh, what, what am I going to get out of this in terms of strategic <laughs> influence in the region and what's this going to cost us? And if you're bringing them to the brink of economic, I wouldn't say collapse, but uh, some pretty deep pain inflicted. Yeah, uh, it, he he should blink. That's that's the hope. That's the hope is if you you push hard enough and Biden kind of conveyed enough of a credible threat that the cost, which Putin may have calculated in, in recent years, have gone down. Right, the, the chance that the Europeans would impose significant sanctions, he may be he may have been skeptical of. But I think I think the message has been much stronger out of Washington, London, and Brussels over the last two weeks than, than maybe the, the Kremlin expected. Can you just very quickly touch, go back to the whole discussion of SWIFT payments? What oh, yeah. So so SWIFT is just a messaging system, right? Like all it is essentially, I mean, this is a gross oversimplification of the service they provide, but it's, it's essentially like WhatsApp or like secure email. There are ways, to, if, if you don't, if, if all you're doing is cutting off SWIFT, you're cutting off like the ability to send a message. You're not actually, pre, you know, preventing transactions from taking place. So transactions are going to keep happening. It's just going to be less efficient. Um, so SWIFT doesn't make a ton of sense when, if the point of imposing the, the sanctions is to like, say, cut off a Russian bank from the global financial system, you impose the sanctions. You don't sanction the, just the kind of external messaging platform that the, the bank uses it. Could Russia you. turn around? I got it. Could Russia turn around and suddenly just start doing business in in the euro and not do do dollars and bypass U.S. sanctions? No, no not easily. The the dollar capital markets are so deep and liquid that nothing else can replace it, and it's not close. All right. F final question to you because you've been watching all this unfold like the rest of us, and you were in on the original sanctions. What do you think is going to happen? Do you, do you think that Biden delivered a tough enough message to President Putin, who seemed to be smiling through part of that meeting that we could see? He's pretty clever. Um, he doesn't always, you know, have a straightforward response to many things, you know, including little green men here and hybrid warfare. And but do, do you think that he is going to have to step back from the idea of invading Ukraine further? I, I hesitate to say that he'll have to. Um, I I will say this. I think the message that the West has conveyed to Russia is extremely strong and aggressive. And I think in April, 
Putin may have calculated that the response from the West may have been here from a kind of financial pain perspective, I think he has to understand that it's much higher now. Um, whether that changes his calculus in terms of making a decision about whether to cross the border and potentially <clears throat> annex the, the LPR and DPR um, or, or, you know, those big swaths of the Donbass is, I, 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 I can't try to get inside his head the same way I couldn't try to predict Donald Trump. Um, I, I'm hopeful, though, that the message is strong enough that those sanctions won't have to be used. Um, Do you feel confident that President Biden delivered the message he should have, that it was... I, Yes, I'm confident that the message has been delivered well. I think there's there's been a lot of good thinking on it from both sides of the pond, <clears throat> including from Biden and, and his team. Um, and I think they've come down stronger than I think a lot of people may have expected. So I'm I'm hopeful that that it's enough. Um, fearful that it's not. <laughs> Brian O'Toole, formerly with the U.S. Department of, of Treasury and now with the Atlantic Council. It's great to talk to you. Thank you so much for all that time. Yeah. Pleasure talking to you. Thanks for having me. And that's our backstory this week. If you don't subscribe to our newsletter, Backstory, gotta get it. DanaLewis.substack.com. I don't write every day, but every few days, and I give you my take on top international stories. Please share Backstory Podcast. We are growing with your support. I'm Dana Lewis. Thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you again soon.